Well, good morning, everyone. So glad to see you. And if you are someone that is joining us for maybe the first time since Easter, or you've been coming a couple times, welcome back. We're so glad that you chose to come back to Grace, and we are just excited, and hopefully we'll be able to meet you later today at Discover Grace. Don't forget that that's today. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. And for those at home, welcome, or wherever you are streaming and watching us, uh, we're so glad that you're, you're joining us in a way that you can uh, learn and, and sing, and uh, just as all of us in the room. So, welcome. Well, my name is Sarah. I'm the pastor of Worship Ministries, and uh, just like last week, we said it many times, but it's still true today, thankfully, every day, that he is risen. Yes, he is still risen indeed. Yes, amen. Well, I'm going to have you stand, because in that we're going to sing a song that says the whole gospel right there, that it says, For he so loved the world that he gave his only son, which is what we celebrated last week, that forever believe, for whomever believes in him shall not perish. What a wonderful song to sing the week after Easter, because that is what we believe. That is why we are here, and we are going to praise his name. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you. 
song today and it comes out of this song I'm actually going to have you take a seat and if you're willing and wanting to join me please do if not and you want to just take this in you're welcome to do that too so let's read this together how lovely is your dwelling place O Lord Almighty my soul longs, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and a swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place near your altar. O Lord God Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house they are ever praising you, Selah. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, O Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, O God of Jacob. Selah. Look upon our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. O Lord Almighty, blessed is the man who trusts in you.
This next part is the beautiful part about the sparrow. together. with us as we continue to worship him and telling his story.
Lord, we thank you that you do love us, that you are the God who has called us out of darkness into light, and we celebrate the fact, the reality, that every day is Resurrection Day. You have risen from the dead. You are here with us. You empower us, and we love you, and we declare that unapologetically and unashamedly. We thank you, God, for who you are and all you've done for us. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Sarah and worship team. That was wonderful. Well, good morning. Welcome. Some of you are awake. I hope the rest of you are. That's good. We're really glad that you're with us this morning. My name is Jay, and on behalf of everyone around you, if you happen to be a guest or I'm visiting with us, welcome. You are a welcome addition to our family here. And speaking of family, I am told that Stan and Carol Rubish are here this morning. Stan and Carol, are you here? There you are in the back. Speaking of family, welcome. For those of you who may not know, Stan and Carol have been serving on our global mission staff in the UAE for decades, and they have just retired from that role, and they are back, and we welcome them back. We're so glad that you're with us. We love you. So great to see you. And just to, just to put a little something out there, so our Global Mission Sunday celebration this year will be the first Sunday in June, and Stan will be our, our speaker for that. And we're so excited to hear from you and just to welcome you guys back. Thank you so much. So with that being said, here at Grace, we're about loving God, loving people, reaching people, and developing people for Him. And we want to spend just a little bit of time inviting you into that, because we really do see ourselves as a community of Jesus followers who extend grace. God has extended His grace to us, and therefore we want to extend that grace to all people, and want all people to have the hope that we sing about and celebrate each morning. So we want to invite you into some of that mission this morning. So to equip you to just to know how to engage here and really get connected, this is our website. This looks a little differently and loads a little differently if you're looking at this from your phone. But if you go to our website here, if you click on that events page, that really gives you a global view of what's going on here on any given week. And there's just a few things that we want to call your attention to as we scroll down, scrolling, 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 to the men's breakfast. I would like to personally invite you to men to this men's breakfast that's coming up on April 20th. I'm, I'm going to be there. I try not to miss these because they are so significant and so impactful. Tim Osorio from our Comunidad Fellowship, our third service, is one of the leaders there. And Tim is going to be our, our speaker that morning. The cost is $10. We will feed you well. I promise Promise no one will leave hungry. We eat well at those things. But it's just going to be a fantastic time. We're deliberately combining with our third service. So this will be in um, English and Spanish. It's just going to be a wonderful chance for community together as the church. So men, we hope that you'll consider coming and that you'll invite someone to come with you. And that's how you sign up for it. You literally go to the website and, 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 uh, and get her done there. So that being said, let's go on to the next thing here. And we want to call attention to um, our solitude practice series. You know, as Jesus followers, we're about being like him becoming like him, being with him, and doing what he did. And one of the things, as you look at the life of Jesus that he did, was often, even in the incredible busy rhythms of his life, he made time to be alone with God in times of solitude. And you might be thinking, in your daily rhythm, your daily life, how in the world do you do this? How do you experience this practice? And really, what, what does it do for you? How does it deepen your intimacy with God? Well, that's exactly what this practices series is all about, is we're going to dive in together about what it looks like to actually implement this practice as a rhythm into your, your rhythm of life. So we hope that you'll be able to join us for this. It's just going to be a significant, fantastic, impactful time. So that being said, let's move on to the next thing. And the next thing is we have a young adults um, ministry group community here at Grace, and they meet twice a month. The next meeting will be next Sunday because it lasts month was a five Sunday month, so it kind of throws off the rhythm, but they are going to be meeting next Sunday. They meet right here in the lobby. This is for anyone who's um, 18 to 29 years old, and you would like to connect with other young adults for community. They gather together right here in our lobby, and they just have a great time together, and you, of course, are invited, and you don't even need to sign up for that. You can just show up, but it'll be next 
Sunday at 6 o'clock here in our lobby. So one final thing, and that is, once again, I would like to personally invite you to this. After our second service today, we are starting something called Discover Grace, and it's going to rotate on a monthly basis here in the life of our church. And this really is an opportunity, especially for those of you who are newer to our church family, especially those of you newer um, this last year. If you've been here a year or less, we would love to invite you to come to this. It's going to be a free lunch this afternoon. Who says there's no such thing as a free lunch? There is. It's here. And we'd love for you to be a part of it. It's a chance for us to get to know you and for you to get to know us a little better. And really, our hope, our outcome from this that we're looking for is we give you a number of options to get engaged deeper into the life and community of, of grace. And so we would love for you to be a part of that. We hope that you can come to that. You can sign up for it. I'm told we have about room for about 10 folks and then we're going to be full. So you can just show up for it. I would encourage you to grab your phone and sign up for it if you're planning on coming back and taking that in and haven't done so. But it's just going to be a tremendous time, and we hope that you'll get to be there. So last weekend, if you weren't here, was just it was an epic weekend. It was just so rich to worship the Lord together at Good Friday and then our three services on Easter Sunday. And I'm, I'm excited to tell you that there were over 1,300 souls who came through the doors this last weekend. It, the, the, the reach of the gospel gospel just went out. Yeah, it was so great. And sometimes, you know, as we're a part of things, and especially those of us who are connected here in community here at Grace, we can take for granted just the many resources that we have and the many things we're able to do. And that's resourced by your and my giving, by your generosity. So thank you so much for giving to the mission and vision here at Grace. The gospel literally goes out on a daily, weekly, monthly, annual basis in so many ways because of your faithfulness. So I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward, and we're going to receive this offering, and I want to pray God's blessing over it. So Lord, again, we thank you that as we take this offering, we're reminded everything we have comes from you. Everything we have is because of you. And so out of an act of gratitude, out of gratefulness, we want to give a portion of that back to you now. And as we do so, we pray that you will take these resources and use them to meet real needs within the walls of this place and outside the walls of this place. We want all people to have the opportunity to know the one true God and the joy and the hope and the purpose and the peace that we get to experience every day because we know you and love you. So God, please take these resources and use them. And Lord, thank you now that as Gabe opens your word with us, that you want us to know you better and become more like you. So we pray exactly for that. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And again, God's people said, amen. And so Mr. Gabe Myers, will you come on up and open God's word for us? Hey, you brought me a coffee. Thank yeah. you. Here you go. Have a sip. <laughs> I got mine. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. He called me Gabe today, which is nice. Sometimes he calls me Gabester. Not sure what that means, but uh, he li he likes me. Uh, he's yes, yeah. I think that's why. Um, today we uh, I'm just excited. I'm the pastor of Hispanic Ministries here, and. Uh, there was a song we sang earlier, and the line that just caught my attention was, tell the story of the one. And uh, man, that's an amazing story. And if you're a Jesus follower, if you know him, it's, it's, it's the story of him and me and what he does, right? Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Peter. But before we do that, how many of you uh, have gone fishing? Oh, yeah, it's Oregon, right? Yeah. Okay, makes sense. How many of you remember the first time you caught a fish? Okay, very good. Maybe later you can tell someone that story, but today is my turn. Okay, um, so I, I was, uh, I grew up, some of you know, I grew up in Paraguay, South America, and when I was a kid, I had to be like maybe seven or eight, maybe, maybe less, I don't remember, but uh, my uncle came by with my cousins and uh, some of our friends, and he said, let's go fishing. So we got our rods, and when I say rods, it's like a bamboo stick with a six-foot piece of line, maybe a uh, nut, like a hex nut, you know, uh, at the end with a hook, and let's go fishing. So we went, we walked, I think we walked like two or three hours to this spot that my uncle had, had figured, you know, this is, this is the spot. And I had never caught a fish before. And uh, we were at this creek, and there was a bridge made out of planks, 
And, and I decided I'm going to fish from the bridge. So the water is maybe a couple of feet below the bridge, you know. And so I put my, put my line in there. And they told me, don't, don't, don't take it out. Wait. When you see that line move, that's when you pull it out. And you couldn't see in the water. It was kind of murky, right? So I put it in there and thinking, the line's going to move? No way, right? But suddenly it goes. And like magic, it's just gone. And I was told to yank. So I yanked, right? And this fish um, was literally like this big. <laughs> and uh, it went flying up over my head and landed on the bridge behind me, right? And so I mean, it didn't stay on the hook. So it landed. So I, I dropped my rod, and I jumped down, and I tried to grab it. And as I'm grabbing for it, it slips in the cracks of the bridge and then goes, and I see it fall into the, into the, into the, into the creek. I'm like, ah, oh, fish are real. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and... And I was, I was hooked. I'm like, oh, this is, and that day, I know we caught, we caught a lot of uh, mandi'i, which is catfish, uh, and all kinds of other pan fried fish, and we went home and had a feast. Um, but that was my first, like, let's go fishing, and I've loved doing it ever since. I love taking my kids fishing when I can. Uh, we went a few years ago up to Trillium Lake, and I remember Shiloh and Sammy, my two youngest, this was a few years ago, but I told them the same thing, and, and I, I cast that thing out there and said, don't touch it until you see that line go. And I remember Shiloh caught one. Uh, he was, if he had, didn't have any patience before that, suddenly now he's willing to wait. But that day, they caught, between him and Sammy, they caught two stringers, just a load of them. There were some college kids that came by, and they were fishing for a couple hours, not catching anything. And they looked over and kept, Shiloh kept reeling them in. They look at that little kid. What is he doing? And, and, and they happened to see me put it on the second stringer, which only had like two or three fish on. And they were complimenting on that stringer. So I said, hold on a second. And I lifted the other stringer, and they were like, oh. <laughs> Um, but it's exciting to fish and to teach other people how to fish. And this story, um, Jesus is going to take the life of a fisherman. And he's going to teach him uh, something even more exciting than fish. <laughs> uh, but I'd like to ask you before we begin, would you take a moment and just pray? Because this is a story about a man, but <laughs> it's telling the story of the one who comes and seeks us. And I'd like to, us to connect with him. And I'd like to just encourage you to have a moment and talk to God. Say, Lord, I'd like you to speak to me. I want to get to know you. Would you do that? Just take a moment and just pray. Father, we need you this morning. I thank you so much for your word, that it breathes life, that it's not just a textbook, but they're the uh, words that have power, transforming power. Lord, I just ask that you would uh, speak to us today, help us understand what you did in Peter's life got 35 minutes to cover his whole life. I'm not sure how this is possible, <laughs> but Lord, uh, would you help us understand the parts that you want us to hear? Spirit, would you teach us what this has to do with, with me, with us? So I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's talk about, let's talk about Peter. One of the things he says early on in, in this story, he, we're, we're about to dive into the books of First and Second Peter, and this is just an overview of his story. But in Second Peter 1.16, he says this, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So the man who saw Jesus and calls him majesty. <laughs> He's, uh, this, this is who we're taking a look at and his life, how this happened. And later on, we're, now we're getting ready to dive into this book. And he's just telling you who he is. 
and why he wants you to listen to him. He was an eyewitness to the life of Jesus, spent time with him. He saw him die. He saw him come back from the dead. He saw him in glorious majesty. And he's saying, these aren't just a bunch of stories. This isn't just, these aren't fables. These are real. And there are secular uh, uh, historians that can tell you that they're written, recorded about the life of Peter. <laughs> that, that tell you about what happened with his life. But here we go. Um, first thing, uh, as we go into this story, uh, Simon's world is interrupted by Jesus. His identity was... I'm a fisherman, right? And yeah, he was, he was waiting for the Messiah. His brother was waiting for the Messiah. They're waiting for the one who would come and free them from the oppression of Rome and set up uh, the kingdom of Israel and sit on the throne, right? They're waiting for this Messiah. But he's a fisherman, and he lives in this place called Galilee, kind of a Hellenist place, which, which means uh, it was a mix of people who wanted to follow the Jewish traditions and the law, but at the, on the other hand, they're so influenced by secular society that it's, there's always this pull between these two worlds. And uh, his brother, Andrew, went and followed John the Baptist. John the Baptist came baptizing, and, and John even told people, I'm not the Messiah, I'm not, I'm not even the prophet. I, I, I'm just one who is calling out in the, the desert, prepare your hearts, prepare the way for the Lord. And John was a John the Baptist, uh, sorry, Andrew was a John the Baptist follower. But one day he hears John the Baptist see Jesus, and John says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Right? And Andrew's thinking, wait, okay, you're not the Messiah, but you're saying he's the one to follow. So Andrew chose to follow Jesus. He and another disciple choose to follow Jesus. They go after him, but this is what happens. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and would follow Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother, Simon, and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. I'm not sure why Simon didn't go. Maybe he was like, well, somebody's got to make money. Uh, I'm not sure he's really the one. You know, but Andrew seems to come and he says, look, we found him. The one we've been looking for, the one we've been waiting for, we found him. And he, and he goes and he brings Simon to Jesus and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, <laughs> imagine this introduction. It's the first time you meet him. You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Kephas. I used to think it was Cephas, and this week Gary corrected me. No, it's actually Kephas, and so it's good, good to know. But uh, which translated is Peter. And by the way, Simon means listener. I don't know. That's like maybe he wasn't such a good listener. And this, when we read the story, it's like, okay, maybe he's not. But, but Jesus changes his name. Uh, he, he says, instantly gives him not a nickname, but a, a different name. I'm going to, you know what? To me, you're going to be Peter, okay? And, and Peter uh, is, uh, Cephas, Cephas is, is stone. Stone, you're going to be stone. And one of the things I love about this is that Jesus sees Peter as he intends him to be. From the moment he sees him, first introduction, he sees, he sees Simon, he says, oh, I know you, I know you, 30, 40, 50 years from now, I know you a thousand years from now. And to me, you're a stone. You're a rock, <laughs> right? So this is, this is Jesus and Peter. And later, uh, Peter doesn't immediately follow Jesus, but then he's, he's still fishing, and Jesus happens to be walking by. There are people listening to him teach, and he comes by, and, and Peter's washing his net. And this picture, by the way, comes from the Jesus film. Um, it's the only place where I find Peter's actually washing his net, like Luke says. And, and, and Luke, uh, he, he's washing his net. They've been, they're done fishing. They fished all night. Um, growing up in Paraguay, the best fishermen, always, I always hear, heard their stories, they would go fish at night because that's when fish would bite. Now, obviously, they're net fishing, but, but he'd been fishing all night. He's washing his net. Boat happens to be on the shore. Jesus is walking by with people. They're listening to him. Jesus says, hey, Peter, can I use your boat as a platform? So Peter's like, sure, why not? So he pushes the boat out, and Jesus begins to preach. And afterwards, he's done preaching, and Jesus says, Hey, Peter, let's go fishing. Interesting. I'm watching him wash his net the whole time. I don't know, maybe it's the whole time. But he's washing his net, listening. He's done washing his net, puts it all away. Jesus says, Let's go fishing. And, and Peter says, um, You know, we fished all night. 
and, and you look more like a carpenter. He didn't say that, but, but <laughs> yeah, we, we fished all night, and, and we didn't catch anything. But, you know, if you want to go, I'll go. So he basically takes him out like one of maybe a tourist who's going out, doesn't know what he's doing. But he, he takes him out on the lake, and they catch so many fish that Peter is overwhelmed by who Jesus is. And, and he, he basically says to Jesus, Jesus, get away from me. Go away from me because I, I'm, I'm, unwor- I'm a sinful man. Peter knows himself. And later on down in the story, you'll find out he actually cusses like a sailor. But, uh, but in that moment, he tells Jesus, I don't deserve to be in your presence. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. You think this is exciting? <laughs> you think throwing, casting this net out is exciting, catching that many fish? Wait till you see what's coming. Right? And so Jesus sees Peter as he intends him to be, but they cast so many fish. You can find this story in, in, in Luke chapter 5, and it's just an amazing, an amazing thought to have that moment where Jesus tells him who he's going to be, then shows and begins to reveal his identity, and, and Peter just is overwhelmed by the presence of Jesus. But Peter has a choice. What do I do with Jesus? Right? What am, what am I going to do with him? And he, he sees him as he intends him to be. But as I think about this story, Jesus comes to us. And, and he, he wants a, a, a meeting with us. And when he meets you, when you take a moment to meet Jesus, to go to Jesus and meet him, he sees me as he intends me to be. He sees you as 10, 20, 30 years down the road, what it would look like if you follow Jesus with your life. He sees that and he knows what that is. And that offer is for you. So the question for us is, what am I going to do with Jesus? And Peter would say, put it this way, he would say, as you come to him, this is 2 Peter, 1 Peter 2, 4, 5, as you come to him, I love this because Peter got, uh, Jesus had just told him, you're a stone, right? Years down the road, Peter writes this. As you come to him, the living stone. Who's the living stone? Jesus. Uh, for, uh, Ephesians 2.20, the chief cornerstone, right? The foundation uh, of the apostles. Jesus is the, is the chief cornerstone. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Who are the Cephases that Peter's talking about? Who are the stones? The church. The people he's writing to. Okay, we come to the living stone, and he sees us as Stones that are being built up into this thing we call church, the church family. This is, this is Jesus sees us as he intends us to be. And this is what Peter is saying. He sees you. I see you this way. And I just absolutely love this picture and what's happening. And the question is, how will I respond to Jesus? Because Peter had to make a choice. Do I stay with fishing? <laughs> or... Do I leave it all behind and follow Jesus? That's a, that's a, that's a big choice. It's, it's an important choice. And, and keep in mind, again, Jesus comes and he interrupts Peter's world. And he offers him a, a, a huge change, a huge shift on how you see things, right? Um, last week, I was going to uh, uh, this uh, airplane builder's uh, shop with my son and his friend, and one of the things we do on our drives there every other week is we listen to an apologetics, um, uh, we'll, we'll listen to an apologetics video and just hear the story, and a lot of times it's a, like a Sean McDowell piece, but last week it was a story of this guy named Nabil Qureshi, and Nabil Qureshi uh, is a, was a Muslim who came to the U.S. or, or grew up here, right, he, he grew up here, but his parents and his grandparents were devout Muslims, Devout, not, not just like we follow, but they were missionaries, missionaries to non-Muslims. 
And this guy, Nabil, grows up in that family, and by the time he's five, I think he had memorized, I don't know how many, how many, how many, how much of uh, the prayers and, and, and chapters of the Quran, but as he, uh, he was challenged by a believer, he started this process. It took three years for him to question and think through and, and grill, is this true? Is the Bible true? Is Jesus really real? Did he really die? Did he come from the dead? And after three years, he's convinced, yeah, this is true, but I still have to make a choice. And if I choose Jesus, my family will outcast me. I will be, I'll put it, I, I, I'll be out. And and he makes that choice. You can look him up. Nabil Koresh, you look him up and listen to his story. But it's this, it's this, when Jesus comes and interrupts your world, you have a choice to make. Do I follow Jesus? And, and is he worth leaving everything else aside to, follow, to know him? Is it worth it? And Peter obviously thought it was. <laughs> and he does. And he chooses to follow Jesus. And as we look at Peter among the disciples, who was he, right? Who is Jesus among the disciples? Here are just some quick points. He was part of the inner three. There were 12 disciples, and three of those were closer to Jesus than the others were, right? Uh, so Peter, James, and John, they were the closest. They were in places with Jesus where other disciples weren't. Like when Jesus rose Jairus' daughter from the dead, they were there. Peter was there. That, that had to be pretty amazing, right, to see this dead girl come to life. Or uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus takes them up to this mountain. I don't know if Jesus kind of walked away, maybe he was praying, but suddenly they look up, and Peter, uh, Jesus, is transfigured. He's beaming in glory, and you've got Elijah and Moses are both talking to him, and they're having a conversation. I would have loved to have heard that, you know, what are they talking about? Maybe it was about the coming death of Jesus. I don't know what they were talking about, but Peter and John, these guys were so overwhelmed they weren't sure what they were like, what they were saying. I'm like, what do I say in this context, right? And then the father's voice just booms and says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And so G Peter was part of those inner three closest to Jesus. He was just a natural leader. Just when we look at it, we'll, we'll, we'll see this more, but he just naturally led. He's, he's mentioned uh, more, more than any of the disciples, but he's a natural leader. He's outspoken. Like, if, you, if all of the other disciples were thinking something, Peter would say it. Uh, he's that student in the classroom that's not afraid to ask a question or say something and be wrong. Right? He, he just, he's outspoken. Um, at times, he's courageous and bold. On the outspoken piece, he was also the guy who asked the questions. If there were any questions, like he asked a question about taxes. Hey, do, Jesus, do you, do you pay taxes? And uh, by the way, next week is what, what day? Yeah. <laughs> So, so Jesus sends him fishing <laughs> to get a fish, and inside the fish's mouth is the coins, the coin that's needed to pay the tax, right? But he, he asks questions. Uh, not only then, there are other times when Peter just asks questions. That, like one time he says, how many times should I forgive my, the guy who offends me? I don't know which of the disciples he was talking about, but, but Jesus says, it's not like seven times. It's basically an exponential. It's 70 times that Peter, many times, you keep forgiving. That was, that was one of the questions he asks. At times, he is courageous and bold, like in the Garden of Gethsemane. You've got to keep in mind, Peter's thinking of the Messiah as the conquering king who's going to establish his kingdom. And this is the moment. The soldiers come to take Jesus, and what does Peter do? He pulls a sword, and he starts attacking people. Cut someone's ear off, right? And Jesus says, hold on, Peter, stop. You know, put it away. Put it away. And that had to be so confusing to Peter because he's expecting Jesus to be this conquering Messiah. But, just, but in that moment, he's taken away. We'll get to that again in a minute. At times, he's impetuous, right? We're going to talk about him jumping out onto the water <laughs> and walking. But there's, he's just bold. But I just imagine, just, as I think about the Gospels, and I imagine the Gospels without Peter, like, man, that would be kind of lame. It, it probably would be okay, but he's, he's there for a reason, and it's, they're just so good, and there's some things he does that nobody else does that I'm thinking if I were there, I would have never done that, but I'm so glad he did, right, because we need to see this. Um, he is the most mentioned disciple in the Gospels. 
He is always mentioned first in the lists of the apostles. And so when Jesus calls the apostles, and that word apostles, by the way, means sent out. Um, In the book of Mark 3.13, this is what it says. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. These are the apostles. What was the purpose? Why did he call them? Two reasons. What's the first one? First one is be with him. And the second one is send them out to preach. And I, I love this because it gives me the heart of Jesus. The heart of Jesus is I want to come into your world. I'm going to interrupt your world, but it's because I want to be with you. He is the author and the source and the sustainer of life. And he wants us to just soak in it, to be with him, to know him, to know his character and allow his character to permeate mine. And so he's going to spend time with Peter and these guys. He's going to be with them so that his mind, the way he thinks, the way he sees the world, that they would see it. And man, as you read the story, it's absolutely amazing to see how they think and how Jesus thinks and how he brings them along and teaches them these things. Yeah, there are two things. One, be with, and the second one, to send them out, right, in, this, in, in these verses. So we're going to take a moment, and, and I don't know if we can do this justice, but we're going to try to cover some key moments or, or key lessons in Peter's life. Okay, here we go. The first one is two bold declarations. Um, is a, a lesson in the identity of Jesus. And, and when, we look at, when we look at the identity, there are two, two moments. One is um, Jesus is preaching, and, and he says something. I don't know if it's in here. Okay. Oh, he, I'm not going to write. Okay, he, he's preaching, and he says, um, unless you eat my flesh, and drink my blood, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. (laughs) And all his followers are listening to him. Whoa, that's kind of gory. What are we, a bunch of piranhas, (laughs) right? And, but, but people hear him preach this, and it's so difficult for them They don't understand exactly what he's saying, but they're taking it for that literal, (laughs) you have to eat my fingers and stuff. And they get offended, and they begin to leave Jesus, and they walk away. So Jesus um, approaches them. He he comes to the 12, and Jesus asks them, how about you guys? Do you guys want to leave too? (laughs) And Peter answers, and he says, where will we go? Peter answers, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. So that's the first time he says it, this amazing declaration of who Jesus is. This is who you are. The second time, Jesus just asked the question. He says, who do people say that I am? What do you guys think? And the disciples start answering, well, some people think you're John the Baptist. Some people think uh, you're just a prophet. You're a good guy. You know, you're going to change history. You're going to be the marker between AC and D. Well, they've changed that too. But, But that same question we could ask today, right? Who do people say that I am? And the world has an opinion, you know, and there are all kinds of opinions. But then Jesus turns the question. He says, who do you say that I am? See, that's the, that's what really matters. Are you going to take the time to figure this out? Are you going to be honest with, with the facts, the evidence? Are you going to look at the evidence? Are you going to take some time to actually figure out? Because figuring out who Jesus is is really, 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 really important. He's the only one who died and came back from the dead. Or so he claims, if you don't think it's true. Are you going to find out if he did or not? Because that's kind of important. And so he asked them this question. He hadn't done that yet. But Peter's answer, he says, um, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Again, he says, you are the Christ. You are the Savior, 
the son of the living God. That statement is so bold. So the answer of all of the Old Testament, the one we've been waiting for, you are him, right? And, and Jesus, if there was a moment to say, oh, no, you got it wrong. I'm not, I'm not him. That would have been it. Like, no, you guys, I'm sorry. That's not me. Like John actually said that I'm not, I'm not the Messiah. But Jesus, he says, Peter, you are blessed from heaven because my father revealed that to you. He affirms what he says. And not only does he affirm it, but then he goes on and, and he says, um, I tell you that you are Peter. On this rock, I will build my church. The powers of hell will not be able to have power over my church. I will give you the keys of the holy nation of heaven. <laughs> Whatever you do not allow on earth will not have been allowed in heaven. Whatever you allow on earth will have been allowed in heaven. Basically, he's telling, he's telling Peter, you're going to have, uh, you're going to have the keys to, to, to heaven right? You're going to have the keys to the gospel, and you're going to let people in as you, as you open the door for people to come in. Okay, we'll go on to just talk about some, some more of the lessons in the life of Peter and come back to this. A lesson on thinking how God thinks, thinks instead of the way people think. Um, this one is, is, is found... Peter actually reprimands Jesus. He goes up to... Uh, Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter uh, 16, verse 21... Uh, keep in mind, Peter thinks Jesus is the conquering Messiah. If you go back all the way to Psalm 2, uh, th this describes the coming of the Messiah as his conquering king. And this is the idea that, that Peter has. But Jesus, in Matthew 16, says from that time, in verse 21, from that time on, Jesus began to tell his followers that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. These hard things would have come from the leaders and from the head religious leaders of the Jews and from the teachers of the law. He told them he would be killed and three days later he would be raised from the dead. Peter took Jesus away from the others and spoke sharp words to him saying, never Lord, this must not happen to you. <laughs> then Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are standing in my way. You are not thinking how God thinks. You are thinking how man thinks. Can you imagine? Jesus begins to say, I'm going to die. They're going to kill me. And Peter's thinking, that doesn't go with what I think the Messiah is supposed to be. And so instead of doing it in front of everybody, let's take Jesus aside and then rebukes him. No, Jesus, that can't be. And Jesus turns and rebukes him and says one of the harshest things he has to, says to anybody, maybe not more than Judas at one point, but get behind me, Satan. Not that Peter was Satan, but Satan is using him to get in Jesus' way. He's, he's using him to say, you don't need to go to the cross. You don't need to. And, and there's this lesson in thinking the way God thinks, not thinking based on temporary things. And so this is the lesson there. Ah, there's that passage. Sorry, I didn't have it for you, but there's Psalm 2. This picture of the, the conquering Messiah. And then Jesus talks about suffering and that he would have to die. Um, we go here. We, we, yeah, those harsh words, get behind me, Satan. You're standing in my way. Man, that seems really, really harsh. But the lesson in this is, is, is really big. Okay, we go on. The story is, we got a few minutes left. Okay, a lesson on the glory of Jesus on that Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, not just that, but all of the miracles. Raising the dead, healing the blind, the lame, right? Watching a demon-possessed man be free and sitting there in his, in his sane mind. And all of these over and over, walking on, calming a storm and so on. There's the, all these lessons. And, and then there's the moment of transfiguration where he sees Jesus beaming. And I'm just, that's just amazing. This is who Peter saw. This is Jesus a lesson on fear and trust. I absolutely love this one. This is maybe one that most of us know really well. It's a story of, of Jesus comes walking on water. If you've watched The Chosen, um, season three, they've done a pretty good job of, I think, I mean, I'm guessing it was more impressive if you were really there, but, but they, they did a pretty good job of trying to represent this. And they're rowing, not really going anywhere. The wind is against them. 
And Jesus comes walking on the water, and suddenly they're like, what? A ghost. And they're terrified. And they're terrified, and Jesus says, don't be afraid, it's me. It is I, right? And, and someone says, it's Jesus. And, and Peter says, if it's you, let me, let, call me, I'll walk out on the water to you. <laughs> not, it was Peter again, not anybody else, Peter, right? I'm going to walk out on the water. What are you thinking, Peter? You're really, and he, but he's like, he, Jesus can make me walk on water. That's really bold. That's a lot of faith. And Jesus says, come. So Peter jumps out, and he, he's walking on the water towards Jesus. He's already walking, and then he looks around and realizes, oh, these are real waves. That's, it's real water. And suddenly the fisherman, who's probably able to swim, is afraid and begins to sink because he took his eyes off Jesus. And he looked at the waves, and he begins to sink. And he calls out, Jesus, save me. And I love this picture in, in the movie where Jesus' hand comes down into the water. And he reaches up and pulls him out. And in the movie, Peter keeps saying, don't let me go, don't let me go. Right? That's not what the Bible says. But the idea, um, this passage of Scripture really has a lot of meaning for me. When, I, when we graduated from college, uh, Bible college, um, the... Uh, uh, the speaker used this passage. And he talked about our future and how many times we would probably face difficult situations or things that would distract us and take, take our eyes off of Jesus. And he said, keep your eyes on Jesus. And I don't know where you're at in life, but man, we live in a real world. We're real humans like Mr. Peter and it's easy to take our eyes off Jesus to stop being with him and just live, think I'm living my world without him and start making decisions without Jesus. And when we start doing that, that's when we start to sink. But even if you are sinking, even if you've already taken your eyes off Jesus and you messed it up, you can still call out, Jesus, save me. And his hand is there. He's there to rescue you. He is pursuing you and he's teaching. And this is about life lessons. And as we go through those trials, our faith increases because we realize Jesus is with us. So there's, there's that lesson. There are, there's a lesson on humility. We move forward when they're all at the Last Supper and Jesus takes a, a basin and a towel and he says, I'm going to wash your feet. Wait, the master is going to wash our feet? And Peter's like, no, 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 no. You can't. Don't wash my, he'd already said, I'm a sinner, get away from me. Now you're going to wash my feet, right? And, and, and Jesus, I'm, let me wash your feet. Peter's like, no, don't do it. And Jesus says, if I don't wash your, your feet, you have no part with me. Okay, then wash my whole body. You know, he's always, one, and Jesus is like, no, no, you've already been washed in, in relationship with me. Your whole being is washed, but our relationship, we need this foot washing so we can eat together at the same table. It's about relationship. We do that regularly with Jesus. When we come and we confess our sins, we're like, Lord, I want to walk with you. I don't want any obstacles in my life. When we started this sermon, I asked you to pray, Jesus, please, that's, that's what we're doing. We're, we're interacting with him and asking him to come and allow him to serve us, right? But that lesson in humility, another one, a moment of great courage. I mentioned earlier that time when he pulls out the sword, right? But again, I wanted to go into this a little bit because that time of, that moment of great courage it's also a moment of, of great confusion, right? It's understandable confusion because his concept, biblical concept, scriptural con concept of who the Messiah is is his conquering Messiah. But not yet, Peter. And that's where he doesn't get it. But in this moment, he's thinking, it's, the, it's time to conquer. This is the moment. They're attacking us. So he pulls out the sword and Jesus says no. And then it, maybe it sinks. He just, he just corrected me when I tried to tell him, you know, that, that he shouldn't die. And it finally is sinking. They are taking him. And he follows him to Caiaphas' courtyard. And he's being beaten. And he's sitting there by the fireplace watching this. And he's confused trying to figure this out. How is this possible? 
I thought he was the Messiah. And someone says, you are a Jesus follower. I said, no, I'm not. And he denies Jesus three times. And the third time, Jesus looks at him. Because he told them, you're going to do this. Your concept of who I am maybe doesn't quite fit what I really, the whole picture. And so Jesus, Peter denies Jesus and, and walks away and cries bitterly. And then Jesus dies. And even if after he comes back and he appears to the disciples, like Peter was the first one to go find, find the empty tomb. But it doesn't talk about this interaction with Jesus until later when he goes up to Galilee. And he goes fishing, right? <laughs> but it's a moment of great understandable confusion. We can kind of understand why all the other disciples ran too. And Peter was actually probably bold in most, right? A sad moment of denial in his life, that moment, <laughs> that fireplace. Can you imagine? And Jay took us through this last week. Just the associations that would happen every time you're next to a fire later. Can you imagine? Yeah. And, and uh, Jesus comes back, and there's this lesson on love, forgiveness, and restoration. And he's out there fishing again at the Sea of Galilee, and there's some guy on the shore building a fire. <laughs> and the guy says, hey, how about you throw your net on the other side of the boat? <laughs> Are you kidding? Sounds like that guy that said, let's go fishing during the day after I've already been fishing. Yeah, on the other side of the boat, people don't know what they're talking about. And he's just sitting there probably mulling this over and finally, well, we haven't caught anything. Why not just try it? So they try it. And suddenly, it's, that net is just bursting. And, and uh, someone says, it's Jesus. And Peter jumps off the boat, swims to shore, goes to see Jesus, and they, they end up, he's already got the meal prepared. I don't know where he got the fish, if you, or if you just said, bring those. But, but yeah, they have this conversation where Jesus asks him the question, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yeah, I do. And Jesus asks him again, do you? Do you love me? <laughs> And Peter says, I do. And three times, do you? Do you love me, Peter? And Peter's answer, you know everything. A few days ago, if Jesus had said, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you know, I'm going to die, and you're going to deny me, and he was the first one to say, I would never. I would go to the cross. I would die for you. Real bold, sure of himself. Now when he asks him, he says, yeah, I do. But at the end of the day, you know how much I love you. You know to what level. You know when I'll deny you or I won't. You know. And Jesus, knowing Peter's kind of different, not this sure of myself, I can do this on my own mentality. He's got this. Jesus answers him. And, and I love what Jesus says to him in the passage. Um, in John 21, Feed my sheep, very truly I tell you. I think it's in here, actually. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. I think there are a couple things in here. Um, the, will stretch out your hands, is talking about a crucifixion. Like, geez, Peter, you're going to die crucified, right? And then the someone else will dress you. I've heard, read different commentaries on this, and they kind of say, well, someone's going to put a cross on you and take you. And I think this actually is talking about the Holy Spirit, who will be the one who leads you where you do not, where like in your flesh you wouldn't want to go. Now, I might be wrong on that, <laughs> but knowing Peter and... Um, in 1st 2nd Peter 1:21 he talks about the prophets of old he says for prophecy never had its origin in the human will which fails obviously right but prophets through he, though human oh, i was hearing that song as i was preparing for this i'm only human after all yeah don't yeah uh, but he, uh, spoke from god as they were carried along by the holy spirit and if we look at the rest of the story 
What are the lessons God's teaching me? I just want you to ponder that. Think about it. What are the lessons God's teaching you, right? But then we look at, at, at Peter. Jesus told, you're going to die crucified. And Peter, he told him, you have the keys and you're going to unlock the gospel. Well, he unlocks the door of the gospel to the Jews and the Gentiles. And the rest of the story, you know, uh, after at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes down on all the disciples and they walk out of there and there are all these people in Jerusalem and they're listening. What are these guys babbling about? But there are people from all over and they're understanding these guys speak in their language. And Peter gets up and he preaches. And he says, this, they aren't babbling. They're not drunk. It's nine in the morning. They're not drunk. These guys are speaking and prophesying. These are God's words to all these people here. And he begins to explain to them, this Jesus you killed, (laughs) he's alive. And the people, as they hear him preach, they're cut to the heart. And like, Peter, what do we do? (laughs) And Peter says, repent and be baptized. And over 3,000 people Come to Jesus that day. Imagine that net being thrown out. Now he's fishing for real people, for people, and they're coming to Christ, and they're being baptized, and they're following Jesus, and it's not just him anymore. It's others. Um, Later, it's not just the Jews. He gets this vision in, in, uh, in Acts chapter 10, this vision. He as a Jew, he's, he's, he's following the Mosaic law, right? That's what they're doing. That's what they think everybody needs to do. But Jesus, Peter gets this vision. This centurion gets his vision. This angel speaks to him. Send someone over to Peter because he needs to come talk to you about how you get to be part of this kingdom. And at the same moment, Peter gets his vision. He's up on a roof. He's hungry. But this blanket comes down with all these unpure, unclean animals that, that someone who is Jewish would never touch. And it says, eat. And he's like, "Uh, no, no, I would never. (laughs) And God says, if I called it clean, it's clean. And so it happens three times. Three times seems to be this thing thing with Peter, right? Three times. And the third time, the vision leaves. And Peter's just thinking about this. And these Gentiles knock on the door. And he goes. He walks with them. He goes with them to Cornelius' house. And he shares the gospel. And the Holy Spirit comes down on them. And he sees the door of the gospel unlocked, right? He defends the ministry of Paul. Paul and Silas go and preach to the Gentiles. They come back. They're preaching in Antioch. They come back, and and, and they're actually on on a mission trip, and they have to come back to Jerusalem, and they tell, you know, the Holy Spirit's working among the Gentiles, and they're uh, believers who are are saying, that's not possible. They have to to obey the, the, the Mosaic law. And Peter stands up and defends Paul and Barnabas' ministry. He's, he's the first one. So he corrects. Uh, Paul is, again, he's human. This, this Peter's human, right? He's corrected because he goes up to Antioch to visit the Gentile church. He's there having a great time. And some Jewish people come from Jerusalem to visit. And as they're up there, he suddenly feels pressure to stop acting like a Gentile. And now I'm going to, okay, I'm going to obey the law and I can't eat with Gentiles anymore. Ooh, can you imagine how hurtful that was? And Paul calls him out on it. You hypocrite. And, and I'm, I'm guessing Peter figured it out and changed. <laughs> but he's human. But I love this about his story. And again, the death of Peter. We already saw that. Um, the death of Peter, according to tradition, it's not written in the Bible, but according to tradition, Peter was, uh, was died on a cross in Nero's circus. Nero persecuted the church. And he took Peter and and put him on a cross. And many say that he wasn't crucified right side up, but that because Peter didn't want to die, he didn't want to die, he didn't feel worthy to die as his master, he was crucified upside down. Now we don't know if that's all that's true. But Peter followed Jesus. And that's what he would want he would want us to do. What will we do with Jesus? What will we do with Jesus? Are we willing to allow Jesus to redefine who we are and live in the identity he has for us? He sees you as he intends you to be. What will we do with Jesus? One of the things we get to do this morning, remember that piece that Jesus said about eating my flesh and drinking my blood? 
Today is Communion Sunday. And we get to eat the bread and drink the cup. And so I'd like to invite you now to take a moment and think about, think about this amazing gift of who Jesus is. I'd like to invite the ushers to come up and prepare to, to serve. But as we uh, play some music up front, would you please stand and come up front, grab the bread, grab the cup, and then we'll take it together. Can we do that? We'll, we'll celebrate, remember what Jesus did for us. So
The Apostle Paul says this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your body, which was broken for us on that cross. Father, we thank you because your son came in flesh and blood. He was one of us. Lord, thank you for allowing your son. Jesus, thank you for pouring your blood on that cross, for giving your life for ours. Thank you, thank you because we can be called just because of what you gave. In Jesus' name, amen. as an extension of our worship on the first Sunday of every month we take another offering that's special for our church it's for the fellowship fund it's something that's special to help people in our community and those who want to enter into our community so I'm going to have the ushers come forward and as we take that we're expanding it to where it's not just our financial giving but if you have a gift or talent or hobby of maybe construction work or you love cooking meals and you want to be on the meal team, will you let us know that? Because that's another way that the fellowship and the care team extends help. So if that's you, you can write that on the card in front of you and put that in the offering or in um, the boxes behind you here in the lobby or in the auditorium. Or you can just call the church and, and let Jerry know or let one of us know that this is something that we can extend our love to one another. Because maybe finances isn't it right now. But I know, I know Scott, he's helped build a couple ramps. He's cooked meals. I know many of you have cooked meals on the meal train. So that's one way we can give our offering as well. But let me pray over this offering, and then we're going to continue worshiping him through music. Thank you, God, for this time now of communion, that we can commune with you, that we can remember what you have done, that all of this has reason and purpose, and that we gather because you gathered your people, wanted them to learn and grow, and then go out and tell I pray over this giving, whether it is financial or it's of their hands and feet. Will you prompt us to give out of our heart, 
to give to the extension of the church. Will you help this be a worship offering? And we pray that it blesses you and your people. Amen. Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ. 
amen to that. Jesus Christ is our living hope, and the whole series is about living hopefully, living in that hope. Um, as we leave First uh, Peter, the end, the, the, this, the dismissal, he says, greet one another with a kiss of love. Uh, no, that, we're not doing that today. Uh, <laughs> there's a section before that, though. Um, and the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. I want to invite you to just go and fish. See you. Everybody just wanted to mention something real quick. We're behind the time today. So if you have kids up in the student ministry room, I would like to encourage you to pick them up.